So, hi, I'm Christian. I'm responsible for the desktop client in Colab Systems, which so far used to be Contact, or still is Contact, actually. Um, today, I want to talk about the next generation client that we're currently working on and show, tell you a bit how, why, are, why we're doing this and what this is all about. So, um, Cube is our, the next generation collaboration and communication um, client that we're currently building. It's aimed at offline capable devices like laptops and mobile devices. Um, we are looking at making it very maintainable and that we can move fast forward without sacrificing quality on the way so that we can do quick iterations. Um, we looked at it's very deployable in various scenarios because we have, um, we have enterprise customers, we have private customers, so we need to be able to integrate in various deployment scenarios. Um, this also includes mobile devices. Um, it's supposed to be a high performance and low resource uh, using components, so it really can support you from the background and you don't spin up your CPU basically because you want to read a mail. Um, so we're, from, from the design, we're trying hard to, to ensure that it is the way that it should be, that, that you just really can quickly start it and stop it again and you don't have to worry about that it uses too much RAM or anything like that. Um, last but not least, of course, we're we're working on a pretty user interface that actually also remains useful. So you may wonder why are we doing this given that we have Contact, which is a large and very powerful application and it's a lot of effort to sort of redo that. The first reason for me, as somebody who has worked for the last six years on improving contact as a full-time job largely, um, is that it replaces contact. Um, we, had a, we have a lot of complexity issues, which um, just really showed um, over the last couple of years as we tried to add new features, that process was just so slow and cumbersome and it was so hard to get the quality to a, a state that, that where we needed to be, um, that I just realized at some point something must be wrong. Um, similarly, we have large uh, performance issues, which then again trigger a lot of workarounds in trying to do caching and other optimizations, um, which again increases the complexity. So contact in many ways often sort of resembles a Ruben Goldberg machine. You have many different um, components that interact with each other um, asynchronously. Um, so that makes it very hard to reason about the state of the application and try to test it because you have so many different um, combinations of, of those components. So that is to a large degree why it, it's so complex and why it's so hard to test. So with Q, we initially just started thinking about why, how can we change the, the architecture of, of contact in a way um, that we can combat that, those problems. Um, what we ended up with was so far away from, from contact that it just showed it, would, it makes more sense to sort of start over on a clean slate, at least design-wise. That doesn't mean we're rewriting everything, but design-wise we started on a clean slate, try to get that right, and then see how we can get from contact to this new architecture. So in the new architecture, um, if you're familiar with um, contact at all, we used to have the application, then we have a central server um, that talks to a MySQL database and then we have different backend processes, for instance, for NIMAP resource, for a mail dear resource, to get access to your data. Um, in Cube, we um, removed that central server. You still have different um, backend plugins, 
this is first of useful because these are background processes that synchronize a lot of data do a lot of work so you don't necessarily want that directly in your main application um, it also isolates of course against crashes so because this is a plugin system so um, you can have people write different plugins for different backends um, if one is of not the highest quality and it crashes it, this doesn't take down your client application um, this we, we call the data access layer sync so that's sort of the Akonadi replacement um, so you have now this library that knows how to talk to the different backends and then the, the client application which is cube so far but could be more applications of course um, then directly accesses the database in process and just talks to the resources because it's a single writer, multi-reader um, system. Um, if we look a bit closer at the resource um, that is built somewhat like, well, let me see. Um, so you basically have cube here, and then you have a communication to the backend process over a socket that just writes commands to the resource, which the resource initially simply queues. Um, a very central piece of the resource is then the pipeline, which just dequeues the queue continuously and processes these items. Eventually, they'll end up in the database. So in here, we can do stuff like indexing and filtering and whatnot, just any processing that needs to be applied to every modification that we have to the store. And then the resource simply emits a notification that the revision of the store has now changed, and all clients can update to that. Um, this gives us a very um, nice loop of how how the data flows so clients always just write that way and on the other way around they simply render the state of what you have in the database so it becomes very testable because you don't really have any intermediate state states that you try to synchronize you you essentially just render what you have in the database um, it looks very similar on the other side where we have the synchronization to the source, so this could be your IMAP server. Um, you have a synchronizer process that simply tries to figure out what has changed on the server. Maybe you have some protocol support like QResync or so, which direct, directly gives you the diff. Maybe your backend sucks and you have to do a full diff, it doesn't really matter. Um, the synchronizer simply tries to figure out as fast as possible what has changed, creates the modifications, queues them, um, and that's then processed by the very simple pipeline. Um, having two queues here just makes sure that we can prioritize, for instance, local um, modifications over a background sync process where you don't really care when it finishes. Um, and then the write back uses the exact same mechanism. It gets notified that something has changed, and then it just replays revisions to the source. Um, yeah, so that way we have these loops in, in both directions. And as you can see, this of course um, builds right into, into the design that, that we store, um, that we have an offline stored that you can work against even if you have no internet connection. And you can replay changes at any later stage. Um, what we also um, made sure is that we have the right place for extensions. So in contact, we have often these bolt-on extensions that are in somewhat weird places, like a scam detection in your email viewer, which means it has to be done every time you look at that email. Um, with the pipeline, we have a nice place where we, where we can guarantee that this this preprocessor is always processed before it enters the system for the rest of the client. So we can do stuff like spam detection, we can 
Um, we can, of course, do various indexing um, tasks. We can do filtering. We can do filtering in a way that we can filter it before it enters the system. So you don't have an email that pops up in your inbox and then suddenly vanishes to pop up somewhere else. Um, we have, of course, the pluggable backend, so you can add support for new uh, groupware servers or whatever. Um, and then we have a we have composable UI components on the UI side, which will eventually allow us to, to do more mashups of um, different views and get a bit away of you have your email client over here and your calendar over here and your notes application somewhere else and they can't interact with each other. Um, because we don't want to rewrite everything from scratch that would take years, obviously. We, um, of course, try to reuse as much as we can um, from, from contact and KDPM. So we try to refactor stuff into libraries that we know we can share with um, contact so we can co-maintain it. And this allows us to move much faster than if, if we um, just went and wrote the client from scratch. It, of course, also allows us to um, learn the lessons to be learned, that we have a lot of experience with the contact code base, so we know where everything is implemented. We know what, the, what problems we faced with that, so we can build on that. Um, another large topic is um, performance. So in, in contact, we have many performance problems by design, sort of. One of its core concepts is that it, it doesn't know what it stores, so you can freely extend it with whatever. However, that also means we, you can't query for any data, which leads to somewhat ridiculous results sometimes, because if you want to show a week in your calendar, what we have to do, and there's no way around that, we have to load all your calendar data, process it in memory, throw 99% of that data away because we don't care. And that essentially every time you look at your calendar. Um, same goes for email threading. Um, we can't query for emails by date and in a threaded fashion, so we load the full folder. If you have 200,000 emails, we load 200,000 emails in memory, and then we figure out the sorting. And because that is very expensive, we have various um, caching layers that try to somehow fix that. But that adds a huge amount of complexity because the caches are also somewhat expensive to build. So we store them to disk now even, and yeah, it just becomes somewhat insane. You also have this you have this disconnect between the, where, where your data is and where your application is, and you have a protocol to fetch data, but if you, if you need too much data for what you're trying to figure out, and you fetch too much, you have to load that all in memory, at some point this becomes a problem. Um, if you don't fetch enough, you have too many round trips, this one scale. So you're always trying to find this middle ground on what works. Um, with Cube, we, we get rid of all those problems because you have your, your database is a memory mapped file on disk directly in process. You can just read whatever you need and throw away whatever you need. It's, it's very cheap to do multiple reads because you're just accessing a memory mapped file, essentially. Um, we, we just use a key value store as, um, as the database. So... And then, of course, there comes the, the whole, like, the startup performance and stuff. We, we don't have any external processes that we have to start. Resources only have to be started if you actually want it to synchronize or update or somehow. If you want read-only access, you just have everything in process. Um, so that allows us just to, to solve many of those problems where we worked so hard before in working around the, the design constraints. Um, on the UI side, we have the 
UI completely written in Qt Quick, so we, we hope to be, to be able to do much faster iterations and try more to figure out what users actually, what are the use cases that we actually want to solve. Um, we want to do more um, a user-centered design approach, not necessarily the, the official methodology. Um, but we don't want to just implement features because there used to be this feature at some point somewhere. We want to support workflows. Um, we're working a lot together with um, the UX guys from KDE, the, the KDE VDG, and of course the people that we have in, at Colab Systems. Um, in the future we will do more um, really testing with users and try to evolve that slowly, but we're also really trying to focus on not just dumping too many features in there for the sake of it. Overall, we build a platform for the future um, with, with Q. This is initially, of course, hard to get started until you're at the point where you have the, your minimal feature set. Um, but this will then allow us to, to move much more freely in the future and actually get the client forward and not just try to play catch up with Microsoft Exchange or whatever. Um, we, since we also want to go on, on mobile platforms, we also make sure that the whole software stack um, remains very portable and controllable. So in, in contact, we have a huge dependency chain. Um, with Cube, we restrict that much more, which is, of course, not to say that we don't have dependencies. We, we use the dependencies that make sense. But if, if we can avoid it, depends you reasonably easy, and that improves portability, then we'll go for that. Um, we also make sure that the whole system remains testable. Um, so we have um, test suites for resources, for instance, that you can, that sort of, you, resources have capabilities, and if a, a resource says, I know how to deal with drafts in emails, we have a test for that. That is a standardized test. If you write a new resource and say, well, my resource can do that now, then we can verify automatically everything that we expect from the client side. Of course, you have to take care yourself that the backend actually works. Um, and then with the platform, we, we also have these composable UI components that will eventually allow us, because we're doing the whole UI in QML, and then these QML components know how to access their data. It, it becomes much easier to do integration things like that in the email view, you show the actual address book component um, that directly gives you access to all the data and all the, all the actions that you expect from your address book component as well. Um, and we can also um, use that directly for, for desktop integration, of course. We could directly show the cube calendar with all the, the functionality that you're used to on a plasmoid in KDE without having to re-implement any of the functionality. So this allows for much better, um, much better and much easier um, desktop integration. So, from the roadmap, we currently focus on email only um, because it's, first, it's, it's from many of, of the data types are list-based, so the email view gives us sort of the worst case scenario for that because there's lots of data. Um, it's also uh, performance-wise the worst case because there's lots of data. Um, and that way we can get reasonably fast to a useful product um, and we can be sure that our design decisions make sense because it actually scales to the use case that is the hardest. Um, we aim for a end user ready um, release by end of the year. We focus on getting the 
the minimal necessary feature set in there and then rather focus on polishing that to ensure that we can actually reach the quality that we aspire to reach. Um, so we try to restrict ourselves a bit in going too crazy with the features. And then over the next year, we expect to add the, the other group where components, so you have your calendar. Um, we'll probably have an address book, of course, with the email client, but then we'll have calendar and notes and task management. Um, we might already have that in a preview version by end of the year, um, but that's not necessarily the focus right now. And then from there on, I hope we can really move forward in also pushing what we can do with the client and what it actually is and that instant messaging and other uh, features and focus more on, on workflows um, rather than these um, isolated features that we so far had. So we can, for instance, support you in having meetings which involves calendaring and email and having a chat and then doing notes and, and whatnot. So we want to really support the user more in what he's actually trying to do. So with that, we get to the demo. Interesting. Um, so that's how it currently looks. Of course, it has still many UI problems, but what we can see here is that if I switch, for instance, between these lists, we don't do any caching or any, of any sorts in, in these UIs. So in, in contact, we used to cache every list every time because it was very expensive to do. Um, with, because here we built the right indexes, so we only have to query for what we actually want to show, which is a bunch of emails, that's not that hard. So we can just do that in, in real time, which keeps the code very simple. Um, yeah, if you switch emails, then what's slow is that this is HTML and has to load some images from the internet. Um, so that also uh, shows, of course, in, in the ap application startup time, because it's essentially instant because it doesn't really have to do anything. Um, in, in the background, it starts the resource process, so it's aware if updates come in. If the client is closed, the resource process just dies because it has no clients anymore, so there's no point. Um, what we see here is also if I scroll down, you, um, if you watch the, the scroll bar as I go down, it gets smaller, which will have to fix UI-wise. But the point is, we even if you have 100,000 emails in your uh, folder, we're only loading like the first thousand or so right now. And then as you get to the bottom, we fetch more, because we have a sort of by-date index right in, in the storage. So that allows us to efficiently just retrieve what we actually need. Um, yeah, so then you can compose email and stuff. Um, but that's, of course, very heavily work in progress. Um, so I've just finish the packages for the summit, so you can actually try this yourself, if, if you like. Um, it's obviously not ready for production. I expect it to be usable um, within the next month for, for your email reading, essentially, that you can, mark, you can mark emails as read and you can move them to trash. Um, but of course, it's entirely possible that it breaks over time. We don't take any care right now that it works between versions, so you sort of have to nu nuke your data sometimes. Um, it's available as um, 
packages for Fedora 23. And we have, from, so from our OBS instance, and we have a flat pack um, definition file in the, the KDE flat pack um, application. So you can build it yourself and give it a try if you like. Um, the development planning is happening on the KDE Fabricator instance. So there you can follow along in, in what we're doing. Um, there are different projects for the UX and people where they mostly work on mockups. And then there's the technical one for, for sync and cube, which follows more the implementation. There's the roadmap that you can follow. Um, yeah, that's it. So Aaron will say a few words on Roundcube next. Unless, should we do questions later? Now, are there questions? Yep. I have a question regarding the fusion of sign and defense. Are you planning to raise a HPG module plugin extension? Um, so the question was whether we plan on integrating GPG support and, and stuff for encryption. So the answer to, this is, to that is yes. Um, so the cube is one of the reasons for cube is that this will allow us to get end-to-end -end encryption to mobile devices as well, um, which we currently can't do over the web. Um, so we already, we got GPG support read-only for free because we're using the KDPIM um, message viewer component, which has already that stuff built in. We don't have any key management right now. Um, there are various plans and also improving the, the usability of the whole key management stuff better that you have, for instance, directly in the address book an indicator whether you actually are able to have a secure, establish a secure connection to that person. Um, so yes, that's definitely something we're working on. Yeah, so the question was what, what all platforms means for the release by end of the year. Um, all platforms for that release means uh, Linux, Windows, Mac OS X. It does not include the mobile platforms yet. For the mobile platforms, we will write an entirely different UI that adapts to the form factor. So that's also a reason why we have this very clear separation between the UI and the logic and which we're forced to do, of course, by, by Qt Quick, but that allows us to s sort of just slap on a new UI that is actually tailored for, uh, towards the form factor. Any other questions? Can you slam contact some more? <laughs> huh? Can you slam contact some more? Christian is taller than I am. <clears throat> I only noticed that once I stepped up to the mic. Um, yes, so um, obviously we're doing a lot of exciting work with Q. Um, and if you're wondering where the name came from, um, this was actually an intentional callback or reference to Roundcube, which is the web um, app that we use with Colab, in which we've been the primary developer of for many years now. In fact, there's one young fellow right there who is uh, responsible for quite a bit of Roundcube as well. So uh, we ran into some, you know, some kind of endpoint issues with with Roundcube one um, in the last year or so. It's a great application, it's used around the world, um, most popular open source web uh, mail app out there. But to do the things we want to do with it, the developers looked at it and went, ah, it, it's, we can't really accomplish what we want to accomplish, which is um, things like 
being able to uh, extend it more easily for uh, integration into corporate workflows, um, being able to um, have a UI that adapts um, if you're on a tablet, for instance. You may have noticed that Roundcube is not overly useful on a touchscreen device, um, especially one with a smaller screen. Um, we wanted to be able to uh, get rid of the page reloads, right? We wanted a very nice modern uh, application, which is just seamless, you load it once, and and you're, you're done. So some of the more uh, recent mail uh, applications on the web have all done, uh, gone that approach, that single page web app, no reloads, just the data coming across. Um, and it enables them to do quite a few nifty little things that we also want to do. But Roundcube 1 was based on, or is, is built around the concept of server side rendered uh, templates, and then you get the and results shipped to you as HTML and JavaScript, um, but it still relies very heavily on this concept of server-side templating. So Roundcube Next um, makes a slight departure <laughs> from this and instead moves the application entirely into the client-side web browser. So you have a single page web app that delivers essentially the same functionality but without the server-side templating. So you get zero page reload, um, access to all of your data, whether that's your calendar or your mail or whatnot. Um, and it also allows us to um, extend what we can do with uh, the web app. So along with, with Cube, which has a very similar name for good reason, uh, there's a clear separation now between the UI or clearer separation between the UI um, and the data. And so this not only allows us to, in future, add specific uh, plugins and components for uh, various use cases without having to rewrite the entire um, uh, the business logic behind it. But it allows us to do things that should be quite trivial, such as if you, if you use Roundcube right now with Colab, you'll notice we have a feature for tagging. And the tagging box appears in different parts of the screen depending on which app you're using. Um, notifications are always in the browser. Um, and if we want to change how notifications are done, we have to go around and, and adjust the, the calls um, everywhere that's made. So there's a lot of duplication of effort. And in Roundcube Next, there's the concept of apps. So uh, we're using uh, Ember.js to actually do the uh, creation um, of, the, of the assets. Um, you don't need to run Node to run Roundcube Next, but just to build it and to develop with it. Um, but this allows us to do things like having a app that does notifications. So there's a pub sub, a publish subscribe bus um, in Roundcube Next that such apps can, well, subscribe to and publish to. So an application say I have a notification and the notification um, app can subscribe to those messages and then do whatever is, is necessary for notifications, be that native desktop app, uh, native desktop uh, notifications or in browser notifications or whatnot. And all of that code and all that logic can then be put in one uh, replaceable and reusable component that lives within the, the larger Roundcube Next um, world. So in addition to that, the other really exciting thing I, I feel about um, Roundcube Next and Cube is that we're designing both of the UIs together. So we're right now if you have contact on, on one screen and you have Roundcube uh, on the other screen, you'll notice they look somewhat different. Um, we're doing the visual design, the workflow concepts, and all of that for both applications in tandem and with the same, with, with overlap in the developers and um, design team. So that when we have Roundcube next and Cube, both ready for uh, production use, you'll have Cube on one screen or multiple screens and you'll have Roundcube next on your other screens and they'll actually look like they belong together. You'll be able to take some of your workflow from one and use it in the other. So the usability will improve um, across the board and you'll be able to learn one way of doing things and just apply that um, to all of your applications. So along with, with Cube, um, the goal we have for Roundcube Next is to be able to deliver a usable mail application um, at the end of the year so that people can start actually poking it with a stick. Uh, with us and then from there we will iterate forward feature by feature by feature by feature until we have a, a complete replacement for Roundcube One's current functionality uh, with Colab and hopefully quite a bit further than that. So that in a nutshell is what we're doing with, um, uh, with Roundcube Next um, on the UI side. 
On the server side, the data delivery side, we are working with a number of companies um, in great open source fashion um, on a protocol called JMAP, which basically takes the horrible thing known as IMAP and makes it a, l a lot easier to consume uh, from a modern style web application. That includes things like having a long running um, update uh, socket so that you can see without having to continuously pull or build that in onto um, some bespoke thing on the server. You can actually get your updates so when new mails arrive immediately, these kind of little features. Um, and also just yeah, remove a lot of the IMAP insanity from your code base and you can just speak this native, I mean, the J stands for JSON. Right? So it's, it's really built for, for the modern web and making it easy to use. Um, so to that end, um, we plan on delivering a JMAP proxy that you can run on the server side that will sit in front of whatever your IMAP server is. Um, there's also work ongoing to actually in, uh, put JMAP support directly into the IMAP server as well um, that we use, Cyrus IMAP. So at some point, you'll be able to just speak directly to the IMAP server, um, so you'll be speaking JMAP to it. Um, but in between now and then, or if you're using a random IMAP server, say you're redirecting around Cube to um, Google Mail or whatever, you can use the, um, the, the proxy for that. Um, otherwise, there's not a whole lot of server-side code, and that's one of the nice improvements um, there is it allows us to really lower the, the amount of, um, uh, of weight that is placed on the server side and the complexity of management and deployment by moving all of that UI um, to the client. So we expect with that design as well, um, increases in or, or improvements in scalability, which is great for those who are using it in, say, an ISP or, I, or ASP um, type environment or large corporate and government um, deployments for that matter. Good. So I don't have a demo, I'm not a Roundcube developer, so um, I can only talk about it. Um, but are there any questions from that? Nope. Cool. Great. Um, so in that case, I'll fill the time a little bit more since you asked about GPG support. Um, there is the, a plugin for Roundcube 1 that does um, uh, GPG through Mailvelope. Um, and this is something we'll also be bringing to Roundcube next and probably rather nicer. Um, and that way we have across the board your, um, uh, your security end-to-end -end encryption uh, regardless of what application you're using at the time. Of course, your key management is still local, right, with, with the web app, so we don't want your keys. Um, you don't want us to have your keys. <laughs> so um, there is still that caveat, you'll be able to access it at least. Um, via that, that route in that direction. Good. Excellent. Thank you very much.